Hello again. Today, it's a little dive into Garmin Connect to see how it can confirm reasons why I suffered big style on the climb recently. We've all been there, I'm sure. I'm finishing with some better news, showing how it also indicates why the suffering isn't always in vain. I've just had a terrific week cycling in the hills above Calpe in Spain with my friends at Velo Tour Spain in Liber, Dave and Tiffany. Back in March, I was dealt a harsh lesson in another part of Spain regarding my level of recovery following spine surgery being nowhere near what I thought it was, which is covered in this film on the channel. Early in this last week, I thought I was still in the same boat after one particular ride on which I really, really struggled. But after doing another ride later in the week and utilizing my geeky stats churned out by Garmin Connect to compare the two rides, I've been able to join the dots and learn a completely different lesson, which I hope might help some of you understand why sometimes cycling just seems so bloody hard and what you can do to avoid plumbing those miserable depths. On the first ride, I particularly struggled with this section, all uphill, some of it not steep at all, but full of short ramps of up to 18%. My maximum heart rate normally is 170, which I very rarely hit. And here I was seeing my heart rate break through that and reach 174 beats per minute. With the associated wheezing and swearing that always comes with me. I was surprised that Allah guide was fist bumping me and congratulating me on my new maximum heart rate when I just thought it meant I nearly died. At least that's how it felt. After I'd swept my lungs up from the tarmac and pushed them back down, this struggle stayed in my head the whole ride after that, feeling very pissed off that I wasn't making any real progress with my fitness. A few days later, I did that same climb again, and things were very different. So after the ride, I got my geeky head on and looked at the numbers, particularly with regard to that disturbing episode with my heart rate. Here is the climb data for the two attempts side by side. There's the maximum 174 heart rate on the first, and on the second attempt, it only reached 170, and the average was 12 beats per minute lower. So my heart rate was more under control. So what were the factors contributing to this difference? On the first ride, I was with my good friends, Eric and Bethan. This is us at the top of that climb after I'd recovered. They're both stronger and fitter than me. In fact, Bethan appeared coming back down to meet me to encourage me up the final tough quarter of a mile. So one thing to bear in mind is self-imposed peer pressure. No pressure from them at all. But we do have a tendency to try harder with others around, which can be a good motivating factor at times. But as we will see, my body wasn't prepared for it. And my higher speed and power shown on these numbers compared to the second ride suggests I succumb to this pressure. Another thing can be whether you're warmed up enough. This climb on the first ride came just 10 miles into a 53 mile ride. So probably enough to me warmed up, but I had no significant climbs up till then to get those particular muscles engaged. On the second ride, I set off with this lovely lot and we headed straight to the colder rats. Definitely a significant climb, finishing by the restaurant pointed out here. Here we are posing at the summit, but by this time I decided to go my own way after that to avoid that same self-imposed peer pressure. None came from the group, they were all brilliant, but I was struggling to keep up even on the flat, to be honest. So then I did the thing that no non-cyclist could ever understand, descending down the other side, only to climb back up again to the top. But it ticked a box for me, colder rats on both sides on the same ride. I was happy with that. And knowing I was going to tackle Heartbreak Hill again later, I followed this ordinary bloke on the bike's normal advice and sought out cake as my ECF, courtesy of this magnificent apple strudel in this summit cafe. 
by the time I got to the climbing question, I had completed over 30 miles with significant climbing in my legs this time. Where the climb you've struggled on comes along your route can be a significant factor to your performance. Almost every club ride I do at home starts with this short, sharp hill and finishes with this climb up the beautifully named, for a cape freak, Apple Pie Lane, much longer and steeper. Yet that first one is always the hardest of the ride because it's right at the start before I'm warmed up. So my crazy heart rate on the climb was one thing, but your heart rate at other times is massively significant too to your performance and can be measured and revealed by Garmin and Garmin Connect. Our recovery from a hard ride happens mainly during sleep, so you have to give yourself opportunity to get enough sleep and of good quality. Your sleep quality is negatively impacted by a drop in something called your heart rate variability, which is the time in milliseconds between each heartbeat. And by keeping this as high as you can, you build a better defense against stress on your body. Wearing a Garmin watch during sleep for a few weeks establishes what your own personal baseline heart rate variability is, rather than using an arbitrary number for everybody. This was my HRV status for the seven days before the trip. Each day's score is an average of the previous seven days, and my base range is shown by the shaded area and was 29 to 38 milliseconds. The night sleep before that ride where I struggled is shown here, that my heart rate variability averaged well below that normal range. Forget that it says it's balanced because that's a seven day average that this night's sleep will soon drag down. Whereas on the next ride, my HRV overnight was back above my baseline of 30. A quote from Garmin here helps reveal the truth. The HRV status below your baseline range can be contributed to training too hard, but it might also be a lack of quality sleep, stress, a change in physical activity, not meeting nutritional needs or a cocktail or two. I was on holiday, okay? <laughs> not unusual to let your hair down. Metaphorically, in my case, of course. Eric and Beth arrived late. We hadn't seen each other for six months. so. I catch up around the table with a carafe or three of red wine naturally followed and flowed. But maybe not so sensible when it's a cycling holiday, for me anyway, as I've realized through experience I'm not young and fit enough to combine both of those anymore. If you don't have a way of measuring heart rate variability, just looking at your heart rate itself tells a similar tale. Before that first ride then, Garmin Connect revealed this poor night's sleep. I went to bed far too late and got up an hour earlier than I needed to. On the second, I still went to sleep after midnight, but got about 90 minutes more sleep after all. And after a night of zero alcohol, it was of much better quality. These three peaks here are REM sleep, which are essential for feeling refreshed and alert when you wake. Whereas on the other graph, I was waking up just as REM sleep was kicking in. Comparing the two, my red wine affected sleep sees my heart rate way above my resting heart rate of 48 to 52 all through the night. But on the second, by 2 a.m., it was more or less there. Little wonder then that on the morning of the first ride, I woke up to see my least favorite of Garmin Connect's brutally honest reveals, my training readiness score. One out of a hundred. Basically it's saying, go back to bed. Impacted also by a tougher than expected shorter ride with Alar Guide the day before Eric and Beth arrived, which along with the alcohol and lack of sleep drove my HRV down, which then delays recovery as a result in poor sleep quality. Ignoring this and riding won't hurt you, but just expect it will be a tougher day in the saddle than usual. Sometimes you've no option. I mean, on day two of Lanzé de John Groats, after a tough day through Cornwall, 
and a tougher one in Devon to come after breakfast, followed by another 12 days after that. Garmin Connect was telling me after the first day to rest and recover for three days. That was never going to happen. On the morning of the second ride in Spain, things had improved after some rest and much less alcohol, resulting in improved sleep. I set off that morning with a score of 43 out of 100. I'm under no illusions that the wild fluctuations of all these stats on Garmin Connect are telling me that I'm often punching above my weight as I try to regain a level of fitness I had before the surgery on my spine. But going through the process of effort and then recovery is necessary to get back to where you want to be. I just need to stop making it more difficult than it should be with some daft decisions around rest and recovery. But that's always difficult when you've paid money to be on a cycling holiday, let's face it. On the first ride, I was negatively impacted by all of the factors that you should be aware of when you feel it's too much of a struggle. And I was able to lessen their effect on the second ride. First of all, I wasn't recovered from the previous day's effort. Secondly, there was way too much alcohol the night before. To be honest, I already knew that any alcohol the night before does impact my sleep quality. So that was just careless. Both of those helped produce the third one, not enough quality sleep. Then on the ride, peer pressure. In my case, like I said, it was self-imposed and made me push harder than I was really able to and needed to. I wasn't warmed up enough to be aggressive up that climb. And I'll add into the mix one that didn't apply to me on that ride, but is a factor for everyone, not sufficiently fuel for the effort. It wasn't the case for me because the food at Velo Tours is plentiful and nutritious. Although on that first ride, I didn't have the benefit of that amazing apple strudel. So maybe cake is the answer after all. <laughs> to many of these are obvious reasons, but hopefully it's been useful to see a glimpse into the science of heart rate variability provided by Garmin Connect to see what those mistakes are actually doing to your body. You will recover and improve, but constantly riding on a lowered heart rate variability will drastically delay and lessen any improvement in your performance. Garmin Connect also helps put some positivity in the mix by showing you positive progress when sometimes after rides like that, it doesn't feel very positive. My current HRV status over a four week period shows clearly the dip during the Spain cycling trip, but then the recovery to a higher level than it was before with the baseline rising to 30 to 39. So my efforts weren't all in vain. Garmin Connect has managed with its geeky graphs to both tell me off and finally pat me on the head and congratulate me. Anyway, time to get out of the classroom, methinks, and back onto the bike. Although with snow on the ground, it's a garage ride for me. And if you found any of this helpful, there's plenty more stuff on the channel if you fancy subscribing by clicking on the yellow icon here. And two examples of more Garmin related stuff can be found by clicking on either of these. Happy cycling, and I'll see you soon.